Thanks very much. I love uh, a kind introduction. Thanks as well to all the students uh, who have been tricked into coming to this vaguely educational event. Please fill your pockets with donuts on your way out uh, and be sure to stick around if you want to come chat with me some more. So I'm Andrew Flax. I'm an associate professor of anthropology over at Purdue University in Indiana in the US. And today I'm going to be doing my best to synthesize a couple of conversations across political ecology, critical agrarian studies and anthropology, looking at 15 years of empirical work with small farmers in Bosnia, India, and in the US Midwest. From a particular economic vantage, all of these wonderful people that I'm going to be talking about today are terrible failures. Their yields are poor. They don't maximize their productive potential. They don't contribute very much to GDP. Their work is labor intensive, and that's all fair. End of talk, goodbye. Uh, for those of you who stay, there is a whole universe of unaccounted costs and variables if we surrender here. And we conceive of farms, which are their own thing, as Fortune 500 companies, apathetic to their role in continually producing and reproducing living things, like people, but also like squirrels and acorns and corn and beans and squash. In talking about feeding the world as if people mattered, I'm hoping today that we can shift this conversation a little bit and reframe some of these key metrics that might revalue a diverse political ecology on these changing farms. Uh, anthropologists like to start talks by taking you right into the action. And so I recall this respected farmer, who I will pseudonymously name Mahesh. Mahesh is the first organic farmer in his Telangana village, about two and a half hours northwest of Hyderabad. He breeds his own cotton seeds in an environment where you can very easily go and buy them. Cotton seed breeding is difficult to do. It's labor intensive. It's hard. We're the farmers, he explains. We should not depend on other people to get our seeds. That's wonderful. How's it going? I asked. Well, it's terrible. They're not coming up. He answered with a shrug. That was the wrong answer. Uh, I had been spending, I was four or five months at this point deep into an ethnographic study of cotton seed decision making. Cotton agriculture in India, very difficult livelihood. It intersects suicide. It intersects uh, cascading debts, pesticide treadmills. And here is Mahesh casually shrugging off his seed failure. Mahesh is heavily subsidized by partner NGO. He's protected from the relatively open market that most Indian cotton farmers face. From the data that I collected, including data on Mahesh's own field, indeed, his yields are bad. Crop yields are much better on farms where farmers grow monocultures of genetically modified Bt cotton, where they uh, fertilize it with purchase inputs, where they spray it with pesticides that persist on their hair and on their clothing and on the foods that they eat that are intercropped. Some of this is to be expected. These are farmers that are chosen for development projects because they're far away from resources. They've been historically marginalized. The seeds themselves are uh, bred to respond well to this cocktail of agricultural inputs. But it's not really even close in situ. And this is not just my data. Anybody looking at the agrarian political economy and focusing on yields would have to see this obvious signal borne out numerous meta-studies, uh, organic ag yields less. Claims that organic cotton in particular is just as profitable, just as high yielding as genetically modified cotton, and by proxy can maintain that level of production with absolutely no other changes in the political economy of agriculture. They might be true. I guess they were true under this particular bizarre field trial, but they're not true in any of the places where I've done this work. OK. Can we all go home then? More importantly, I think, is that who cares from a certain perspective? This impulse to judge by a pretty narrow band of success, yield and uh, capital, that misses a lot of the real benefits that Mahesh's agriculture actually offers. It sets us up to make the wrong kind of intervention on the wrong kind of terms. This is a solution to there's not enough cotton in the world. And we do not live in that planet. More yield is only the answer if the truest aspiration of agriculture as a livelihood, aspiration, and way of being in the world is to seek to produce as much cotton as possible so that, I suppose, we can maintain a global supply glut, 
so that global prices may be depressed, so that cotton can be spun in sweatshops, so that it can be sent around the world in fast fashion, so that it can then rot methane, uh, several times more damaging the carbon dioxide as a, carb as a uh, greenhouse gas in landfills around the world. Looking to the Midwest, where I live and work in the United States, we are massively productive in our agricultural capacities. Is the point of that to do what we currently do with that system, which is to produce as much ethanol, as much cheap, low-quality beef, and as much high fructose corn syrup as possible? Is that the key to a good life? Paul Robbins has called political ecology a trickster science. And so what happens when we get to play some tricks and live in a, a different world, perhaps, or a, a parallel world, where we approach farming as if people mattered? Thinking to agriculture not as a limited uh, commodity production site following the rules of a capitalist factory where there are two classes of people, people who own stuff and people who work in stuff, and these are not the same people, which is generally not true on small farms, but rather as a landscape that is alive, that produces and is produced through communities of practice. I've called people like Mahesh show farmers to try to highlight some of the effective and performative nature of their work. But that's not to say that they're just like performing, that this isn't reality, because they do a lot. They calculate local variations in things like neem leaves and the toxicity of cow urine potency to make homebrew pesticides. They shift the programs that they work with to align with key community goals, whether or not those have anything to do with cotton. Stuff like agitating for a general store that could bring consumer goods into uh, remote areas. Stuff like agitating for transportation lines so the kids can more easily get to school. Telling Ghana cotton farmers receive things that can be easily quantified, like price bumps in their organic cotton, but also free seeds and equipment and loans and consultations. Some of them are directly employed by these programs. One of the great benefits of working with organic development programs in South India is that the intervention will step in and wait in government offices on your behalf. They will do your paperwork for you, connecting you to interest-free loans and irrigation pumps, stuff you might be eligible for, but in practice you would have to commit like months of waiting and being ignored in the uh, JD office to get. Organic agriculture gives farmers in this region a reason to preserve agricultural biodiversity, not because organic as a regulatory label is like so great, but because it creates a lot of side markets. It regulates things like windbreaks and crop plants within farms and on-field edges. This aggregate uh, has this aggregate effect of leading to more biodiversity, more food self-provisioning, more food security, and that's seen on conventional farms in the reason. And there's more than just material stuff. Mahesh is like a celebrity. He's been visited by members of parliament. Film stars have gone to see him on charity photo ops, much more importantly. How we feel about a heavily subsidized cotton farm that produces lots of stuff for relatively poor people, with cotton and capital accumulation fairly low on that list, says something less about them than about us. It reveals to us what our biases might be around what we think the purpose of agriculture really is. Certainly, people have crunched the numbers to say that we're heavily subsidizing the conventional global system that we have right now. So, for the next 40 minutes or so, let's think with the opposite. That farming exists to feed people, to create jobs, and to preserve life. This is a flip that demands that we've got some way to recognize yields and profit as, yes, important, but only part of a larger context and what it means to feed the world as if people mattered. So this is me doing anthropology as I do near Ward Angle, Telangana, uh, speaking with a cotton farmer a few years ago for the basis of a 2019 book. I'm sorry, I didn't bring any. Um, I forgot to bring them across the border. But this book is free and open access uh, and anyone all books are free to download, students in the room, if you know where to look. If you don't know where to look, talk to somebody. Um, obviously buy mine, but mine's free anyway. Uh, so check this out if you're interested. Um, I've got a couple of ongoing projects on agrarian change grounded in environmental anthropology, which theoretically assumes that we humans shape and are shaped by our environments in fundamental ways, and empirically it sets out to go hang out in those shaping places and figure out what people are doing through this combination of long-term case studies and triangulation of different sorts of methodologies. Uh, today, informed by 18 months of field work across six years in South India in the 20-teens, 
two months of field work in Bosnia, 2017 and 2022, uh, enhanced by some conversations with friends in the diaspora communities of St. Louis, and uncountable meetings with new and alternative farmers in the American Midwest since 2009. Um, I took this title, uh, As If People Mattered, from uh, an environmental thinker, E.F. Schumacher. And like Schumacher, my As If People Mattered title stems from a certain kind of bemusement around this narrow view of what counts in an economy, with the agrarian version of this being the sociologist Frederick Buttle's term, productivism. The point of agriculture is to produce growth in yields that is intrinsically desirable and that benefit to all stakeholders. It's kind of a, an adoption of a classical view of economics applied to farms. Uh, I'm also concerned over a, a theft of shared resources or commons, things that economists might term externalities, but that the rest of us kind of have to live with as the conditions of our life. Uh, a little bit more aggressively, the environmental historian Jason Moore calls these cheats, things that are taken but not paid for, uh, this accumulation by dispossession. And from this title, kind of a bemusement around who this is all supposed to be for. If producing massive amounts of canola, uh, to take a Canadian example, or corn and soybeans closer to my home, is terrifically good at feeding hungry people, or uh, if it slowly seems to be poisoning us. Schumacher makes this nice insight in his book, Small is Beautiful, that fits in well to this anthropological tradition of questioning value and efficiency as social constructions. That is to say, things that vary across space and time. What's at the core of this is that there is some division here between stuff that counts in an economy and stuff that does not, things that are external to that system. Schumacher doesn't get quite so much into this in Small is Beautiful, but a lot of authors have explored these shortcomings through feminist and decolonial analyses. The economic tends to be most often that highly visible, explicit actions of material and capital production. The spectrum up here that takes an awful lot for granted below. A larger context of access to resources, to land, to willing and trained people. Uh, by contrast, these base conditions making sure that we can get to work in the first place, social reproduction of domestic work, human reproduction itself, all of our common pool resources, that stuff tends to be hidden. An insight from feminist scholarship is here by J.K. Gibson Graham and my Purdue colleague Titi Bhattacharya. Uh, and relatedly, these base claims to land, labor, and resources have got this taken for granted historical ongoing violence that backs them up. An insight from decolonial theorists is here. Uh, Max Leboyron. The disciplinary bias of anthropology is to small-scale observable holism. We're going to assume that nothing really is ever truly external to an economic relationship. Um, I'm only here today because of the unpaid work of, in this case, two women, my wife and my mother-in-law, who came up from Wisconsin to be with the kids, so that I could leave and the, my one-year-old and five-year-old will not die in my absence. That is unpaid work that allows me to be here doing something that looks an awful lot more like formal work. They're both work. J.K. Gibson Graham offer us this diverse economy's iceberg as one way of framework for merging these things back together again. A vocabulary for reading against the kind of dominance that would see everything as a market and everything specifically as a capitalist market, again, where there's this division between people who own stuff and people who get paid to work on stuff that they don't own. Reading for difference under this iceberg allows for a much more expansive part of my actual job, which is to be an ethnographer and sit around with people and look at what they actually do, how they actually work, how they actually create value, make sense of their world. I like this one too because it it's, might be an impulse. We love dichotomies in, in social sciences. It might be an impulse to say that material production and social reproduction are completely separate and different. But of course, if we see, if we're paying attention to the iceberg, rather than that one little line of, of water there in the diagram, we can see that these are all actually the same thing. This is all very helpful because small farms follow very different economic kinds of rules, especially around ownership and production and labor. They combine different streams of being in the world, their homes, their investments. They make complex demands on skilled labor. They're alive at the end of the day. From a century of theorizing about why it is that peasant farmers do what they do, we get this model from uh, Soviet economist Alexander Chayanov and sociologist Yandau Vanderplow, optimizing work, autonomy, and diversification. We also get a, a look at a, a how kind of question that focuses especially on skill 
as a repertory knowledge that's performed in context from people like Bob Netting, Glenn Stone, and Paul Richards. Identities, aspirations, roles, and stages in farming have a lot of material consequences here. We wouldn't separate, say, a theory of gender or masculinity from the environments produced by, say, being a good farm boy or being a good old boy or being a good farm woman uh, in the ways that these produce physical environments around us. Of course, this is a very large discussion. There's a 700-page book uh, that you can check out by one of our audience members today. But across all of this, the work and resources of farm production depend on reproducing living beings, like farmers and soy microbes and seeds. And so social reproduction is critical to keeping these farms going. This is very poorly captured in a cost-benefit spreadsheet that wouldn't recognize hardly any of that iceberg as work. Uh, as an experiment, I tried to make an agricultural iceberg and immediately was able to fill it up with all kinds of fun below the surface action. And it was surreal for me to realize that I too, I go out with like surveys and I write down stuff like yields, hours worked, uh, work that you've done. <laughs> and I fill that in dutifully with numbers and the back of those surveys, they're always one-sided. This is something I recommend to anyone who wants to be a field researcher. The flip side of that survey is filled up with all the actual reasons why anybody did anything. Why are the yields the way they are? Well, because the chickens were running around, or I had to run after my kids, or I broke my leg, and we had big medical debts that we had to deal with. I had been recording all of this social reproduction data, and then myself externalizing it. Oops, don't worry, you can make mistakes too, and we all change them. This is how we grow as people. Uh, all of this work is obviously essential for the top of the iceberg to function. You, you can't have, say, yields if you're not paying attention to things like field edge foods or soil health or uh, biodiversity and perennial plant food security. Lest anyone think me you know, even more romantic than I am, uh, child care on the farm often means putting your kids to work, so not everybody loves that. That's a complex issue for any family enterprise. Uh, to take another one of these dyads, farm work is often unromantic and hard. Power within the household determines who does the worst work. The intergenerational power of parents over children, the patriarchal power of men over women. And yet sometimes it's fun to cultivate the growth of living things around us. We make friends with our animals, we make friends with our plants, rather than unrelenting drudgery. Does anybody in this room have a, a plant or an animal that you care for? <laughs> Indeed, we're there. No students? Come on, people. Put it, you got windows, yeah? You have a cactus, maybe. Uh, we in this room are likely quick to rec recognize a landscape like this uh, as shaped by socio-political forces, to see this not as just natural, but in many ways as anthropogenic. And a lot of us are reconsidering this term anthropocene with some of our critics uh, arguing that we can't pin global environmental change just on anthro, just on a universal humanity because that downplays who's really driving a lot of these costs along lines of uh, class, race, gender, caste, geography. And so instead we get all kinds of things uh, that we say are driving this change like uh, capital, like plantation logics, chthonic multi-species becoming with, viruses, mass killing, uh, a little more optimistically a dawn of caregiving in my own minor piling on here. Uh, what this vocabulary offers though is being able to see the co-production of social and natural forces is all the same thing, kind of like our iceberg. When it's so ingrained in us, uh, in the European tradition, uh, university tradition anyway, since Descartes, to see nature and, and so social spheres as separate. More accurate way then of looking at the world offers uh, people like the environmental historian Jason Moore, uh, is that political and economic regimes act on and with and through this web of life, all the streams of energy natural and social, which means that an economy is an ecology, and an ecology really is an, ecolo an uh, economy in literal ways. They co-produce one another. In one of these regimes, capitalism, we have this outgrowth from a previous colonial political order that provides a new way to appropriate work by turning nature into something that is cheap and ready at hand resource to be consumed. This is a system built upon a racial and gendered formation whereby most living people uh, those deemed to be non-white, those deemed to be women, uh, those deemed to be indigenous, were seen as resources. Uh, this is economic and ethical stakes. Humans devalued in an ethical sense, that people are denied dignity and respect for their efforts in life, and in the economic sense that all that work would go unpaid. In effect, 
This outlines the ways that that social reproduction, the under the iceberg bits, become so invisible. This is the method by which the water fills up, even as they are critical for anything on the top of the iceberg to work. I sometimes explain uh, social theory when I have to, uh, to students, as this lens for viewing the world. It's a series of focusing lenses that allow us to say, hey, listen, life is complicated. Let's pay attention to just this small piece of it. So through these twists and turns, we arrive at a theoretical compound lens here that actually gets us back to that original question, what of value is produced by these small farms? And in fact, to say that there's something really valuable that's produced by a lot of these small farms, especially for a 21st century of agrarian change that's going to be defined uh, by a lot of very aggressive politics so far, by a, a changing climate, and by new needs for an aging uh, agricultural workforce. From uh, a big theory perspective context, from more and others world ecology, a way to describe how a social ordering creates and is created through an ecological relationship. From feminist political ecology, an impulse to understand a wide range of production and reproduction that makes life possible and meaningful and just. From critical agrarian studies, a key real world check on what people actually do, how they make decisions in a dynamic landscape. From uh, my anthropology roots, this holistic comparison across empirical case studies and how this social reproduction actually works below the iceberg. The undercurrent between all of this the method that reveals how these pieces fit together is that social reproduction question. The focus here on not how do we produce enough food, but really how do we produce enough farms? Farm here meaning how do we produce enough living landscapes that support a community in place? I say this as someone who left my town of a thousand. There weren't jobs there. That is not sustainable. The world's farmers, again, already produce a lot more food and fiber than we need. States and markets simply aren't distributing that food to those who need it most. Attending to this capacity for social reproduction in these farm spaces, filtered through the critical agrarian studies, the diverse economies, the world ecology, that helps us to restore this hidden value, reorients really what the purpose of farming is at the end of the day. Uh, I'm appreciative to the Microsoft PowerPoint Smart Graphics team for giving me lots of images to emphasize interconnection here between these different lenses. Here, what do you look for? What's cheap? How are different forms of uh, production and reproduction in conversation? What do people do? And uh, interestingly for an anthropologist, what's that disconnect between what people say they do and what they actually do when you live with them for a couple of years? All right. I promised one health. Uh, and I was not trying to trick you. Bear with me here. I think this compound lens also uh, offers something here. Because when we look to diverse economies and invisible labors and all the environments that emerge from this, there's this clear connection between what we might call the health and well-being of an individual and the health and well-being of this larger multi-species community of plants and animals uh, and the people who live in there. One Health Research has done very well to say things like, we can't thrive if the livestock aren't thriving, as here from Tumbi et al. Uh, we can't thrive if our free-ranging chickens get us sick in our efforts to eat well. We can't thrive if the fruit bats got displaced by some loggers and then therefore raid the orchards next to our farm and that gets us sick. Or if the loss of wild and pastured animal foods in a changing landscape gives us this overall sense of ill health that's not just about nutrition, but is the loss of a way of life, the cultural loss of foods that are valued, of spaces that are valued, of practices that are valued. This is a social reproduction question. It's an attention that I would apply to these farms as the same kind of holistic attention that we look at with a One Health lens to look at disease and nutrition, or one that would uh, kind of take this medical uh, approach of the political uh, economy of health here, or the, the sociological dimensions of health. Usually, we pay attention to these spaces because something has gone wrong. And don't worry, I'm about to yell at somebody in the next couple slides. But it's also possible to fold this into a base condition and say that this is this should be our base condition for success rather than a post-mortem diagnosis and say, okay, these farms don't produce much capital, but then again, capital isn't always all that good at producing health. Now, is it? Because bat habitats and mom's chicken decisions become externalities in that, in that way of accounting for the economy. One reason then that these small farms are so important is because of their capacity or perhaps their inability to escape those externalities, but their capacity for social reproduction those necessities made invisible and cheap. 
A brief historical proof here before I get into my case studies because I want to say that these shorthands are useful for identifying positive community supporting measures, which I'll talk about, as well as vampiric community devouring measures, things like plantations, where we see genocidal power exercised over space and life. The anthropologist Sidney Mintz describes sugar plantations in the Caribbean as laying the foundations for colonial capitalism, where monocultures were basically the very first assembly lines. They devalued human lives in the name of fulfilling the purpose of agriculture, which in this space was to produce as much molasses as possible. The engineer and philosopher Malcolm Ferdinand took this one step further, showing how the same production logic had a kind of lived experience consequence, because it created a new kind of professional management class, especially the white male overseer. He who could turn key crops into profit, and in doing so reject the possibility of living outside of a racial, gendered, ecological, and class hierarchy. Kind of a biopower win for the Foucauldians in the room alongside the military and economic implications. All nicely captured here by the painting by Jose uh, Rivie, uh, Rivera, uh, Diego Rivera, the sugar cane, where we see hierarchies of class, gender, non-human life, and labor uh, all on one tableau. The plantation form evolves through the colonial period and is folded into what becomes capitalism in the 20th century to center fundamentally agriculture as yet another factory, a consequence of what the historian Deborah Fitzgerald has called every farm factory, where agriculture's new commodity frontiers are no longer just people and land and stuff, uh, but also means of efficiency, mechanization, and speculation, financialization, as much as the material stuff itself. These resulting farms as factories did a pretty good job of reproducing those plantation ecologies, and they also rearranged social aspects of rural life for communities in place. There is um, an objectively boring, but also really great book by the anthropologist uh, Walter Goldschmidt on uh, agrarian change in the 1940s and 50s in California small towns. And he looked at this consolidation practice. What happens when all the small, town, uh, small farms become one corporate entity? What happens to the rest of life? It's a diverse economies question. And every civic institution, all of them, from sidewalks to newspapers to schools to movie theaters, through that consolidation of the economy into one thing that existed to use people up and then sell out, in this case, uh, chicken uh, to others, so perhaps a, a southern Ontario analog here, uh, all of that diverse economy dried up as agriculture scaled, accumulated, and dispossessed through this combination of policy and production. And so, for example, we get things like the incredibly productive Midwestern U.S. corn agriculture that produces tremendous amounts of things, an incredible growth from 1995 to 2010, and yet over the same time period, absolutely no moving of the needle on, say, food security. Uh, over this period of 1900 to the 2000s, a century of farm loss as farms scale up. This soaring growth comes alongside the depletion of all kinds of life in rural U.S. Agrobiodiversity, yes, but also the socioeconomic hollowing out of these communities, a major contributing factor for those who remain to things like rural hate groups, to things like a populism based in white supremacist nostalgia, to things like the rise of opiate drug use in rural areas, paying the cost of the social reproduction that enables cheap beef, cheap ethanol, uh, cheap high fructose corn syrup, that would collapse that system. It demands a kind of equal human dignity that is not possible if the goal of agriculture is to make as much ethanol as possible. On the ethnographic scale, there are also existential consequences. Marx uh, described how people in factories become alienated from both consumers and from the stuff they make because of that division in society. Uh, here on a farm, that alienation from a tool, so-called like a tree or a seed, that becomes a commodity is also the severing of a relationship between two fundamentally alive beings. Uh, anthropologists like Mike Dove have shown in Borneo where rice kicks off this bigger cycle of multi-species relationships, a whole thick cultural meaningful exchange that is completely severed by something with no social life, which is cash crop rubber. We saw a lot of similar things in these relational differences when we contrasted Telangana farmers' knowledge between highly volatile commodified cottonseed markets, and relatively stable rice seed markets, a different crop that's got a lot more social um, meaning invested in it, in part because you save your rice seeds every year. They are not simply commodities to be bought. 
these are bad odds, and yet there's still some room to grow uh, on these echoes of plantations and factories and farms. Geographer Judith Carney has talked about how African and African American people use traditional knowledge systems to exercise some power under the conditions of enslavement on Carolina rice farms. Anthropologist Maitri Jacobathason has shown how Tamil tea workers sustain networks of mutual aid across war and economic change on tea plantations. Even Indian BT cotton farmers, people who absolutely are terrific capitalists and chase capital accumulation at every turn, they still intercrop their farms to some extent in this sector. So returning to this compound lens, what do we end up with? World ecology tells us that this plantation factory farming appropriates unpaid work across a hierarchy of whose lives matter and whose work matters that creates, that manifests this ecology that is functionally hostile to all life that cannot be bought and sold. From critical agrarian studies, we can see how small holdings get dispossessed and therefore this repertory knowledge gets split up or gets commodified. And this furthers the consolidation of farms. It's hard to learn how to become a farmer if you've never been a farmer before. So it's that severing of this skilling process. Diverse economies literature would link this consolidation of fractures and all these other institutions of social reproduction with a lot of the greatest burdens falling on people who are lower in that social hierarchy. To take one example, uh, the extremely staggering high rates of sexual harassment faced by migrant farm worker women uh, in sectors in the US and in Canada. And through these changes in what people do every day, we get a relationship that changes between people and land and other living beings in this landscape. Not one that totally severs something like a land ethic, but something that definitely changes how we would relate to that, how we would think about well-being, how we would go through this cultural notion of what's value, what counts in the economy, and what doesn't. With all of that bleak stuff out of the way, it is helpful to look at some of these examples of an agriculture where, in fact, people matter where the point of farming is to anchor this diverse economy of rural social reproduction rather than to grow a commodity production site. Certified organic cotton in Telangana and coffee in Andhra Pradesh, two Telugu-speaking states in South India, offer environmental development opportunities to farmers across pretty different farm ecologies and supply chains. Organic certification lets India export 380 million US dollars of products grown more than uh, by more than three times as many certified organic producers as in any other nation. This growth is all well and good. It's great for organic commercial enterprises. It's great for states that would tax them. But we're not really very far below the iceberg here. We're still talking about wages. We're still talking about uh, remuneration, which are all good things. And part of why that's a problem is that if organic works because it is competitive on a so-called free market system, then it's often going to begin from a losing position because it is disadvantaged by all of that context I just spent all this time talking about. That system only pays for the top of the iceberg. It's always going to fail on those terms. Or it's going to be pushed to conventionalize, to externalize some of these costs to maintain that cost efficiency. India boasts more organic cotton growers than any other nation. And yet, 95% of all the cotton that's planted in that country is still genetically modified and cannot be certified as organic. So we're talking about a pretty niche market here. Uh, I spent six years surveying thousands of planting decisions on GM cotton farms, and people told me about this relentless and competitive pursuit of yields. All the farmers planting organic cotton with whom I spoke reaped considerably lower yields, and it was frustrating, and they knew about it. Farmers talk a lot about yields. They talk a lot about technology. They talk a lot about profits as paths to a more comfortable life especially as their kids and other forms of labor leave. What then is the benefit of low yield organic agriculture? And that's a question that returns us to the celebrity farmer Mahesh, but also to all those rippling benefits that extend from organic farming as a diverse economy. Organic development props up local cooperative institutions like the state-sponsored women's self-help group pictured here. Groups that help to distribute resources and financing, but also help small groups solve problems, ranging from pest attacks to gripes about financing to who's going to get married next and all other forms of fun gossip. These are spaces for Eleanor Ostrom called Idle Talk. And those are really important if we're going to have a group that works together and manages a common pool of resource. Cooperative structures can also play this interesting buffering role with top-down development. Uh, here you're looking at a chicken shed project. Farmers received 45,000 rupees for this in 2014. 
makes for a great homegrown development story captured in tours like this that I tagged along with. 45,000 seemed a little bit high for what was essentially a box and a light. Uh, and so I hung back and asked the farm in Telugu, how much did this cost exactly? Uh, and he told me 15,000. Smiling at this, an NGO worker came over and explained, look, don't you understand, we can fund three of these with that kind of donation. The farmer agreed and explained how in this case, the money had been shifted over to something much more important, small loans managed for the self-help group, paid labor for work that would have gone otherwise unpaid, and pipe repair in town so that there wasn't quite so much standing water so that kids don't get sick, so that you don't have medical bills. Through this project, the group had been able to transform a well-intentioned over-expenditure into several different useful tools because they were vested with the authority to manage their own finances through a cooperative system that everybody had buy-in for, because they had an organic group that demanded that they set up such a thing to begin with. It's nothing I would recommend on your taxes, but it's certainly something that was highly effective for solving this problem. Other side projects can encourage biodiversity through intercropping that allow people to build a range of agrarian skills, so keeping those skills in circulation, subsidizing food security, and also, perhaps more importantly, uh, fast-tracking sales to local state buying programs like the school lunch uh, midday millet buying scheme that was happening during this time. Uh, still happening. Women organized the packing of free seeds for distribution, so a little bit of social capital, also arranged by the development program, adding in a little bit of free of, of pay and also a free meal that they don't have to cook, which doesn't come up all that often for most of these people's lives. Again, an easy me means for biodiversity. Organic cotton does not offer an escape from difficult work. It is still hard to do this. It doesn't offer exceptional yields. Those are key promises of productive farming. There are key challenges to models that demand more human labor, and that's always the complication, uh, something like Beth Finnis has shown uh, in her work in the Coley Hills. But instead, many of the more difficult logistics in farming are directly subsidized here through creative financing, through finding value in other work like these semi-commercial seeds or homebrew pesticides pictured here, uh, similar to some of the rippling benefits uh, of organic agriculture that uh, Arthur Haru has, has described as well. This decenters yield growth. Really, this is a cotton development project that says cotton's not all that important. And in fact, when organic development Programs lose this lead when they start to imitate capitalist enterprises and say their purpose is growing cotton exports. I've seen them alienate partner farmers because farmers are joining these groups in search of stability. And they stay for a lot of these side benefits, not because they care very much about elite consumption of organic cotton somewhere far away. A few hundred kilometers east in Araku, Andhra Pradesh, coffee farmers are still recovering from the 2014 cyclone, uh, the Hudud managing young coffee uh, farms that provide not very much coffee for not very much money. Uh, black pepper is a much more lucrative crop. It climbs silver oaks that shade coffee gardens, but it wasn't even being sold as a certified organic product in 2018 when I was there. Most farmers sell their coffee to government buyers or to private brokers who don't offer these premiums in the first place. There is virtually no market pull. And yet, farmers kept an aggressive foothold in this program continuing to certify their land as organic. And that's because farmers and organic coffee managers saw agriculture as a means to a really important end, which was sovereignty and ownership over land, and flexibility and sovereignty over its management. Uh, the 2006 Forest Rights Act has strengthened Adivasi farmer lands claims, but those rights still have to be actively fought for and defended. I had to fight for respect, coffee cooperative president explained to me during an interview, describing his experience registering coffee forests in Vishakhapatnam. Unregistered land can be quite easily stolen for things that are much more lucrative, like bauxite mining. But coffee forests, as in this quote from the manager above, also set off this chain of reaction of land security. Continued investment in agroforestry secures land and biodiversity over a longer period of time. While unproductive land is vulnerable to cattle grazing, that raises the initial cost of starting an agroforest that makes it all the easier to sell these mountains for parts. In Telangana and Araku, farmers describe this tension between encouraging out-migration for better work and maintaining the land for the next generation. And smallholders everywhere probably talk about this Chinovian paradox. I want to keep my land, and I want my kids to have an easier life. While the current generation of farmers is pleased to see that their efforts and hard work are getting more respect and money through organic, they're also a little bit hesitant to desire the exact same version of rural success for their kids. But still, a lot of these people are coming from communities that have struggled for generations, sometimes militarily, for the right to have land and control its ownership. And so they hold tightly onto land as this tangible asset 
Land can be easily sold and liquidated when you have one of these emergencies. So it's really important uh, as a form of financial and social security. Here, enabled through organic farming. Not because organic farming is so great, but because organic farming allows for a much larger uh, diverse economy to exist here. So it's not the premiums or the elite consumption or the yields that might signal success here. World ecology success that this is a agrarian political economy that tempers a market and so produces this ecology that resists the plantations because it has found value for this other work. This is the ecology you get when you value paying people and giving them ownership over land. In centering land use and diversifying the economy, organic farming rewards long-term agroforestry, decentralizes the development decision-making, preserves some autonomy. And it's not perfect. The show farmers get more than their share of the benefits. The same prejudices that exist in society still exist in the co-ops. Uh, there are persistent assumptions that women do unpaid work, like cooking and weeding here. But what really seems to make a difference is in how these programs pay for a social reproduction that decenters cotton. Facilitating cooperation, securing land tenure, rewarding agrobiodiversity, keeping these skills in place. Moving west to Europe, Bosnian Muslim small farmers have seen the end of a state. They've seen a genocidal civil war. They've seen climate change in their lifetime. Waves of outmigration and wage work are pulling kids off the farm as they do in India, as they do in Canada and the US and around the world. Speaking from the vantage of state statistics, ag productivity is pretty low. In contemporary Bosnia, farming produces around 6% of the GDP, which is surprising because around 60% of the population is rural. Bosnia is a net food importer because that rural population doesn't move a lot of food into these formal markets. Anyway, there's a lot of uncertainty in land tenure given this combination of out-migration and war and uh, post-socialist reforms. Now, whether or not it's a problem that communities aren't commercializing their gardens and allotments is probably a matter of disciplinary perspective. Because it's also possible to say that it's kind of a good thing that we should all be a little bit more Bosnian in that a third of Bosnians produce significant amounts of their own food for local consumption and sale while using agroecological methods. Uh, the anthropologist Petr Jelicka has called this quiet sustainability, speaking of long-standing food self-provisioning processes in Eastern Europe. Garden maps like this chart out how every single 100%, those aren't numbers you usually get, 100% of households in this region plant fruit trees and cultivate annual vegetables on scales from fields to kitchen gardens. We counted 80 edible crop species in active cultivation in 2022, alongside dairy cows and horses, sheep, pigs, goats, chickens, uh, bees. A surefire underestimation of the actual living things sustained through this system. Unoccupied homes still have got an orchard that marks a continued ownership and a continued aspiration for a time when the family might be able to return. Gardens and kitchens play this geographic role because they create the physical space through which you can organize the logistics of social reproduction. A double exchange of material stuff like food and work and cigarettes and equally important immaterial stuff like gossip and sympathy and care. This sharing gray economy is the most real economy for most people's daily lives because this is a very cash poor environment. Our key interlocutor, Dahlia, here pictured making sarma, has a reputation as a skilled producer of pekmets there in the corner of boiled apple syrup. Through this, she negotiated for a steel boiler paid on credit through the promise of future syrup. The terms of this exchange were mediated through a handful of cucumbers, moonshine, and halal sausages. Special issue of goodwill uh, on the part of the blacksmith, a Christian Serb by heritage for Dahlia, Bosnian Muslim. And so this landscape that gets co-produced with this gifting economy is one of, in Larissa Yasharvich's words, intimate debts. You get an ecology that is structured around having enough cucumbers to take to your neighbor when you need something. That has a material environmental impact made possible through a garden that provides, let's say, enough, but not a whole lot extra in case something goes wrong. We're just surviving, explains Dahlia's cousin Sharif. He is sharing some homemade rose soda with us as we admire his wheat harvest. I got enough, he repeats throughout the interview, but I don't have anything extra. These fissures crack the surface of everyday Bosnian agrarian life because the food is nourishing, and this is, they will tell you, one of the most beautiful places on earth, but there is no expectation of financial security against any of these costs. Uh, repairs, consumer goods, medical bills, the impacts of a drought pictured here. Sharif is an outlier. Most of this work is done by women, especially older women, a holdover from Yugoslavia, 
wherein women were expected to maintain these community and land uh, labor efforts while men were off doing whatever it is men do in factories and cities and abroad. And this is complicated because it allows for a cultivation of a pride and an ownership and a real way of being successful in the world, but also a lot of pressure to produce these gifts and to share to just survive. Socialism affected one kind of ecological regime for Bosnian farmers. This current post-war political stagnation and climate change affects another. Agrarian change here is this function of uncertain tenure, uneven remittances, and uncertainties of an aging population that contracts its gardens to adjust for diminishing mobility. This has persisted through Ottoman, Austro-Hungarian, Yugoslavian, uh, and the current vulture capitalist organizations. Communities find it meaningful, but also necessary and occasionally a lot of fun to produce these ecologies and economies. Uh, lastly, alternative food networks are common responses to food crises. Americans gardened during the World Wars, uh, and this happens again during the 2008 financial crisis, and again during the COVID-19 pandemic. As the pandemic concluded, we were able to talk to farmers who reflected on these tensions between newfound growth and the stuff that attracted them to farming in the first place diversification, stability, interactions with lots of people. An unexpected player in this became spreadsheets, an invisible infrastructure of cost-benefit analysis that brought up all kinds of responses. When you fill out a spreadsheet, you have to decide what belongs in the economy and what doesn't. There is a value called value that you have to input. This is our year of simplicity, explained an urban farmer in one of these Zoom interviews. We don't have 1,001 products anymore. We specialize in 10 to 20. Local farmers were turning to their data as demand grew, beginning to ask where they could save time. I really want to focus on preserving my labor costs, explained a peri-urban orchard manager. Are there ways that I can automate to reduce labor and time spent? This is where it gets tricky. The geographer uh, Julie Guffman has called this creep conventionalization. But we can also see it as a data management issue. When problem solving for intensified demands, this non-neutral accounting software tells you what belongs in the economy and what doesn't what you should pay for, and what can be externalized. Most Midwest farmers, most farmers, have somebody in the household who walks off, works off the farm. But as that fell away during the shutdowns, a lot of people responded by intensifying their farm businesses. Yes, to recoup lost wages, but also to finally focus on that one hobby you weren't able to do before. As much as it was frustrating, it gave us the time we needed to put everything into perspective, explained an erstwhile car engineer, now expanding his CSA. Labor is often talked about in the ag circles as something we should reduce. We've got to flip that on its head. We're doing a healthful, meaningful activity, explained the rural Wisconsin farmer. A peri-urban apple grower delved into his data not to specialize in top sellers, but to understand how to turn buyers on to rare and unusual varieties. I'm a teacher, he said. It's this educational variety uh, aspect of this that I dearly love. The analysis is murkier here, I think, because they're more aggressively entangled with capitalist metrics through the spreadsheet tools that they use, through the assumptions of the markets that they work and sell. This, share, this accounting struggles to capture the full purview of farm goals, ranging from long-term soil health to regional biodiversity to it's fun to grow food, and instead privileges what you get when you add up a spreadsheet, which is monoculture, simplify, focus on your top sellers. Those are the right answers if you're running a business, but they aren't necessarily the right answers if you're looking for a long-term stable living ecosystem. Some farmers embraced growth, sought automation. Others resisted this in important ways, including revaluing work and diversification. Spreadsheets are fungible tools. You get to change and decide what you're valuing in those rows and columns. Um, there are at least a couple objections that we might raise to this. Uh, a key demon for political ecologists of agriculture is Tom Thomas Robert Malthus. The Malthusian objection that we need to produce more food or we're all going to starve seems to me to fail all four of these lenses, particularly because of that original Malthusian error, to mistake hunger for a state of nature rather than a political question. Uh, Degrowth might be an attractive answer to some of these concerns. It's professionally irresponsible of, of me to really dive into this uh, because one, I, I report back what people tell me for a living. No one has ever told me I want to grow less. Insisting on that without income substitution feels like class warfare to me. Uh, two, degrowth thinking has got this kind of uncomfortable overlap with the Malthus crowd that says that all of this would be better if there were simply fewer people. Uh, three, we can be really productive in some forms of social organizing. Uh, socialist takeover of energy proposed by geographer Matt Huber, very interesting in the US. 
Uh, there's also been a lot of unbelievable productivity across time and space through agroecological management. This is usually how we fed the world. Small plots can be incredibly productive. We don't necessarily need to grow less. So degrowth is, in these ways, I think, kind of ill-suited to these smallholder ecologies. Uh, as someone who works in smallholder groups in US, Bosnia, and India, uh, I feel like I can't fully embrace a central state and think that it's totally cool and will have no ulterior motives. The geographer Chiesaki Kabara has called this uh, green colonialism with her description of state and NGO moves to end whaling and oil extraction in Alaska. Uh, Faisal Mullah has shown this as well, how state conservation solutions in Canada reproduce a, a colonial fortress model, spraying glyphosate from the sky to preserve a lumber plantation at the expense of a diversified indigenous food system. The imposition of a state morality is always going to be some reflection of power, and someone's going to be left out of that. Uh, central planning for ecological systems, as people like James Scott have shown, tend to enforce biopower at the expense of diverse ways of living. We can't really efficiency our way out of this kind of thing. Um, that generally fails at a local and global political economy level because efficiency tends to be a trap. The more efficiently we get at using a resource, the more of it we tend to use. The classic case being Jevons' example of uh, coal fuel, but also gasoline and electricity. In alternative agriculture, as we try to get more efficient, we tend to externalize more and more of these things. So efficiency really bends us back uh, towards these externalized costs. As Phil Loring has written, in natural systems, it's diversity, not uniformity. That's going to maximize our productivity in most of these cases. Lastly, it's not always great to be peasant. Uh, these situations can't feed the world right now in the global political economy that we have because it's not set up to do that. Uh, first, some of these small holding farms reinforce the violence of settler colonialism. I've been talking about small farms like they're great, and I think they generally are, but they have a long history and ongoing present as tools of empire. In US homesteads, past and present, they reproduce a future that is based in a white Christian supremacy, the erasure of First Nations people, a patriarchy. Uh, ongoing Israeli settler colonialism that is mobilized through collective farming reproduces a future that is bereft of Palestinian people, that is bereft of Palestinian landscapes, that is bereft of Palestinian olives. As ever, solidarity, valuing the equal dignity of life across the landscape, gives us a way to know the difference between a small farm that reproduces life for all and a small farm that reproduces empire. Uh, anyway, more practically, uh, nearly all people get their food from markets integrated with local and global trade. Self-sufficiency is great, uh, but that's a goal. It's not our first step here. Um, by way of, of closing here, the first research I ever did uh, as an undergraduate anthropology major and member of the cooperative dining system at Oberlin College in Ohio uh, was to go to community gardens in Northeast Ohio where I learned that research was a job. Uh, it's a real job. They pay you to do this. Uh, and I learned to participate and observe to take things seriously. Uh, urban gardens are great for all kinds of things. They grow food, generate income, uh, they circumvent food apartheid. All of these will fail on some level. But maybe their primary goal isn't to sell as much zucchini as possible, but to make a friendly, lovely collective space where you can get to know people and make living in the city a little bit less alienating. Because instead of leaning into the nihilistic conclusions of an ontology that seeks to cheapen all life it cannot sell, it is also possible to have a lovely afternoon in a garden. These aren't failures just because they can't completely replace Canadian Tire and Walmart tomorrow. Gardens allow lots of different kinds of people to get together and feel safe in a city. They are central nodes and webs of interrelation, allowing people to play and listen to birds outside. They revalue things like good food, joy, childcare, and safety, this diverse political ecology of work. It is nice sometimes to be outside and play in the dirt. This combination of Marxist, environmentalist, feminist, and agrarian theory lets us look at agriculture as if people mattered here, refunding social reproduction, to recognize the benefits of these less productive spaces and the profound damages of the system that we've got. If the point of farming is to fund fast fashion and to drink high fructose corn syrup, then yes, these programs fail but they're tremendously productive because they do everything else. They're engines of social reproduction, affecting diverse economies through diversified economies that enable continued autonomy and continued enskillment, practicing living on these farms, feeding the world as if people mattered. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, large groups of people who uh, 
meant well when they funded me at the time, uh, and I look forward to speaking with you.